Welcome and thank you all for finding time and attending today's webinar, Carbons, Zeolites, and Molecular Sieves. My name is Jeff Kenvin and I am the Technical Director at Micromeritics Instrument Corporation, a global leader in material characterization technology. I'll be your moderator for today. Our speaker for this webinar is Dr. Katerina Pikart, a Technical Application Consultant at Micromeritics. If you have questions, please write them to the chat during the Q&A session following the webinar. The webinar recording will be available on our landing page, micromerdix.com slash webinar, in the next five to 10 days. You will also be provided a link to the recorded webinar via email once it becomes available. I'm pleased to introduce today's speaker, Dr. Katerina Pikart. Dr. Pikart studied at the University of Hamburg, the area of material science fascinated her, and for her PhD with Professor Michael Froba, she synthesized porous materials with a focus on nanoporous metal organic frameworks for the storage and release of nitric oxide. I'm handing over to Dr. Pikart now to learn more about carbons, zeolites, and molecular sieves. Thanks, Jeff. I'm happy to continue our webinar series with a presentation by carbon, zeolites, and molecular sieves. And of course, I want to focus on the characterization by gas adsorption. So welcome, everyone, and thanks for finding the time to join us today. I'd like to start today with a brief introduction of porous materials in general, and then talk about zeolites, activated carbons, and molecular sieves. The main focus will be on how to use gas adsorption studies to learn more about your materials properties. Here I will talk about the classical data reduction models like BET and T-plot, but also show you two more advanced techniques. One for investigating ultramicropores in carbons, and one for the determination of connectivity in zeolites. If you think about porous materials, you might have a particular class of materials in mind. Maybe you even have a one and only favorite porous material. So let's have a look at some prominent examples. There are of course zeolites, microporous aluminosilicate compounds. Other also silica-based materials are typically amorphous silica gels and the highly ordered mesoporous silicas. A related group are the periodic mesoporous organosilicas, also referred to as PMOs. These are distinctive due to organic groups within the walls. CPGs are controlled porous glasses, so therefore another type of silica-based porous materials. There are also three-dimensional phosphates that have very similar structures and porosities to zeolites. And looking at carbons, besides the very well-known activated carbons, there are ordered mesoporous carbons, often referred to as OMCs. All these materials are classical inorganic materials. Metal organic frameworks, or MOFs, on the other hand, are, as their name suggests, hybrid materials. You might have attended one of our previous webinars about MOFs. If not and you are interested, the recordings of those webinars are still available on our homepage. Now, talking about porous materials necessitates the definition of pore sizes. This was carried out by UPAC, and we see here the three ranges that are divided into micro, meso, and macropores. Micropores have a diameter of up to 2 nanometers and are again divided into supermicropores and ultramicropores. Mesopores have diameters in the range of 2 to 50 nanometers and all pores above 50 nanometers are referred to as macropores. There is one additional definition which is the one of nanopores. Nanopores are all pores that show a diameter of less than 100 nanometers. I always like looking at the historical background in chemistry. And if we look at the development or milestones of porous materials, I think it would be fair enough to say that the last century was the century of porous materials. Looking at the silica-based compounds, the first porous classes came up in the 1920s. Then starting in the 1950s, a lot of synthetic zeolite structures were reported, followed by silica gels and phosphates. And only in the 1990s, the ordered mesoporous materials with prominent examples like MCM41 and SBA15 were reported. In comparison, the porous carbon chemistry looks a little bit boring, but appearances are deceiving. 
The work of activated carbons also started in the early 20th century. And it is noteworthy that it was around the same time that pioneers in the field of adsorption, for instance, Langmuir and Prunauer, Emmett and Teller, the inventors of the BET theory, published the work. Ordered mesoporous carbons are typically synthesized by using ordered mesoporous silicas as templates, which explains the similar time of invention. Other inorganic materials with permanent porosity are metal and ceramic foams, as well as anodic aluminum oxides. And then we find the metal organic frameworks I've mentioned already, as well as covalent organic frameworks as relatively new classes of materials, which were first reported around the turn of the millennium. Zeolites are microporous aluminosilicate minerals belonging to the group of tectosilicates, also referred to as framework silicates, due to their three-dimensional framework structures. There are over 40 natural and more than 200 synthetic structures reported. The name zeolite is derived from the Greek root for boiling in stone and goes back to the Swedish mineralogist Axel Friedrich Kronstedt, who observed that when heating up such a mineral, large amounts of steam were produced from the water that had been absorbed by the material. Zeolites show nice crystallinity as well as defined stoichiometry and surface chemistry. The structures can function as solid acids. This is due to the composition of zeolites. The framework is assembled from silica and alumina tetrahedra, and the structure shows one negative charge per alumina entity. Therefore, the structure also contains counter ions that are weakly bound and can be exchanged with, for instance, protons or ammonia. The pore sizes typically range from 0 0.0 to 1.7 nanometers, and high surface areas of up to 1,000 square meters per gram are accessible. Due to the counter ions, zeolites show high adsorption entropies, which result in high storage densities and a high regeneration temperature. Zeolites are used in many different areas, and the applications illustrated here, whether in medicine, environment, agriculture, or petrochemistry, are by no means all of them. Two properties of zeolites are decisive for applications, which are ion exchange and adsorption capacity. A large field of application is the use of zeolites in water softening, for example, in detergents. And then I would like to emphasize, above all, the importance of zeolites in the field of catalysis. Either the zeolite itself acts as an acid catalyst, or metical particles are the actual active centers. Typical applications here are cracking of hydrocarbons, synthesis of gasoline from methanol, synthesis of propylene oxide, and selective catalytic reduction of nitrogen oxides with ammonia or urea as reactant. Besides zeolites, activated carbons represent a second large group of adsorbents. The pore size range can be broader for these materials, covering the whole range from micro to meso to macro pores. The porosity consists of open pores which are interconnected like a sponge. Specific surface areas can be up to 2000 square meters per gram. So the inner surface of 3 grams of activated carbon corresponds to approximately the surface of an American football field. Note that the micropores have the largest share of the specific surface area. Activated carbons can be produced from different starting materials. In addition to plant-based, animal, mineral or petrochemical materials, such as brown or hard coal, various plastics can also be used. Activated carbons made from raw materials, such as wood, peat, coconut fiber and nutshells, are also known as biochars. As with zeolites, the fields of application for activated carbons are very versatile. Their adsorption capacity allows activated carbons to be used for removal of unwanted color, taste and odor from gases, vapors and liquids. Examples are drinking and wastewater treatment, indoor air decontamination or filter systems in gas masks, and filtration processes in the food industry like the removal of undesirable flavors from vodka. A great advantage of activated carbons in that regard is their thermal reactivation capability. So as we have talked about zeolites and activated carbons, what are molecular sieves? We hear and read a lot about molecular sieves. In comparison to the two previous examples, however, this is strictly speaking not a material class. 
but the functional designation of a group of substances which are characterized by a high adsorption capacity for gases, vapors, and dissolved substances with specific molecule sizes. That means molecular stiffs have a small pore size distribution and are especially suitable for separation processes. As pore diameters are similar in size to small molecules, and thus large molecules cannot enter or be adsorbed by smaller molecules can. Most prominent molecular sieves are zeolites, and you typically find the classification of the molecular sieve by its pore size and angstrom. Some application examples are drying of organic solvents, oxygen and nitrogen separation from air, or the removal of H2S from natural gas. It is probably quite obvious that gas adsorption is the technique to characterize adsorbents. In general, it is the most widely used technique to measure the exposed surface area of a solid material and powders to get information about pore sizes in the micro and mesoporous ranges. Adsorption itself describes the adhesion of atoms, molecules or ions from a fluid phase onto a surface called the adsorbent, illustrated here. The film that is built on the surface of the adsorbent is then called the adsorbate. Physical adsorption, also referred to as physisorption, is caused by weak interactions between the adsorbent and the adsorptive, which are for instance van der Waals forces. During adsorption experiments, the amount of gas adsorbed is determined and plotted versus the equilibrium pressure, which depending on the gas is often expressed as a relative pressure. These experiments are generally performed under isothermic conditions and the temperature and nature of the adsorbate play an important role in the mechanism of adsorption. In the UPEC paper that I mentioned previously with regard to pore sizes, we also find the classification of isotherm types and hysteresis loops. You see here the six typical isotherm shapes. For zeolites and activated carbons, we commonly observe the type 1 isosomes associated with such microporous materials. The isosome is collected as the volume of adsorbate on the surface and inside the pores increases in a characteristic manner with increasing pressure. Gas adsorption studies are typically carried out at cryogenic temperatures. This is because at temperatures like room temperature, gas molecules typically have a high kinetic energy. You could say they just move too fast. When approaching the flat surface of a solid, they might be trapped only for a negligible time, thus the amount of gas adsorbed in these conditions and on flat surfaces cannot conveniently be measured. As I've already mentioned, the temperature needs to be constant and we need to give the system enough time to equilibrate especially at low relative pressures for zeolites and activated carbons when the micropores are filling. We can use the gas adsorption data, so adsorbed volume and pressure values, to calculate surface area, pore volume and pore size distribution. I want to use this hypothetical isotherm of a material with micro and mesopores, so a combination of type 1 and type 4 isotherms, to show which pressure ranges are relevant for different adsorption phenomena and therefore the corresponding calculations. The adsorption process begins at very low pressures in the micropores. The limiting uptake here is related to accessible micropore volume rather than by the internal surface. That is why we talk about constriction, because the amount of gas adsorbed is controlled by the enhanced adsorbent-adsorbate interaction and pores having dimensions that are similar to the molecular dimensions of the gas. The magnitude of the surface area is directly related to the pore size and the available pore volume. Increasing the pressure, we reach a region where the monolayer multilayer adsorption on the pore walls takes place. This is the range also referred to as BET range. I will come back to that later. In addition to the gas-solid interaction, we now also observe the gas-gas interactions, followed by condensation of the adsorbate in a liquid-like phase. This phenomenon is named capillary condensation. When all the mesopores are filled by the liquid adsorbate, the isotherm typically reaches saturation and a plateau is found before reaching the real saturation pressure. At this point, the adsorbed volume can be used to calculate the specific pore volume for the detectable range, so for all pore sizes that would fill at this pressure. Typically, the Gerwitz rule is used for this calculation. 
It states that the volume of liquid condensed in the pores of a porous solid from a condensable gas near its saturation vapor pressure is equivalent to the volume of the pores. An important condition for a meaningful determination is a well-defined saturation step. Therefore, we find a limitation especially for macropores. I would say the specific surface area is the most widely used parameter to be achieved from gas adsorption. The principle looks simple at first sight. Knowing the gas properties, the specific surface area can be determined by the number of gas molecules that form a monolayer on the surface of the material, like shown here in a simple illustration for just one particle. Multiply it by the area which one gas molecule covers and divide it by the sample mass. The area covered by one gas molecule or atom is referred to as cross-sectional area and defined in the instrument software. Langmuir assumed this simple scenario. After the formation of one monolayer, the adsorption process is completed. Therefore, this approach was quite straightforward. But unfortunately, this is not the truth for physisorption. Neither is there a nice monolayer established, nor does the adsorption process stop just after one layer. The reality looks more like what is shown here. And that means for calculating the surface area, we need to use the adsorption data to determine the amount adsorbed in a statistical monolayer. In the isotherm shown, that point can be related to the knee in the curve at a relatively low relative pressure. Brunauer, Emmett and Teller developed a method for calculating the amount adsorbed in such a statistical monolayer, assuming multilayer adsorption. This is a more realistic case compared to the Langmuir model. However, it also comes with some simplifying assumptions. For their calculations, they assumed a non-porous uniform surface. They defined the heat of adsorption of the first layer to be significantly higher than in the successive layers, and the heat of adsorption of those following layers to be equal to the heat of condensation. Also, lateral interactions of the adsorbed molecules are neglected. Based on those assumptions, Prunauer, Emmett and Teller described the volume adsorbed as shown here as a function of pressure, volume adsorbed in a monolayer, and the empirical constant C, which accounts for the adsorption enthalpy of the first layer and the enthalpy of condensation. The equation can be transformed into a linear form, and now we see nicely that by knowing the adsorbed volume, Va, and the relative pressures from our analysis data, the monolayer capacity and C can be calculated from the intersection with the y-axis and the slope of the fitted data. What we see here is the corresponding graph, which is called the VT plot. It is important to notice that the linearity does not apply to the whole range of the isotherm. Therefore, for data reduction, the linear range of the BT plot must be chosen. For non-porous, meso- and macroporous material, this range is typically between the relative pressures of 0.05 and 0.3. If we read the work from Prunauer, Emmett, and Teller, we see that, strictly speaking, BT is not applicable for microporous materials. What we typically observe when applying the classical BET range to microporous materials like zeolite Y, seen here, is a negative intercept with the y-axis, resulting in a negative C constant. And that is something which is physically impossible. We also see from a graphical point of view that the isotherm is already saturated in the considered range, marked in blue. So even if we could think of a stage where a monolayer inside the microporous is established, that would have been the case at lower relative pressures. Despite the discussed limitations, it has become common practice to apply BET for microporous materials as well. However, one needs to know what to do. Rockerol, Llewellyn and Rockerol first published in 2007 some criteria that must be fulfilled when using BET for microporous materials. Those criteria were also adopted in the UPAC report I mentioned earlier. First, the BT plot should be linear. Second, as already mentioned, the C constant must be positive. When plotting the term N, which is the adsorbed volume, times 1 minus relative pressure versus relative pressure, the resulting graph must be continuously increasing in the selected range for data reduction. This we refer to as rock and roll plot. And the last criteria is that the relative pressure value that corresponds to the monolayer capacity should be within the selected BET range.
The Micromerics software shows the rock and roll plot in the BET data reduction window. Therefore, the first three criteria can easily be checked. Furthermore, our software offers the use of an so-called auto BET script. You can find that in the advanced report options. The script is an automated BET calculation and it checks for all the four criteria. The t-plot is a method that allows for the estimation of the external area. And for a micropores material, that means the surface area not caused by the micropores. For the calculation, we need the isotherm of a non-porous reference material, which idly shows the same surface chemistry as the material of interest. The reference isotherm is transformed into a thickness curve. That is, the thickness of the absorbed film plotted versus the relative pressure. In a next step, the absorbed volume of the experimental isotherm is plotted versus the thickness that the reference material shows at the same relative pressure. This is called the t-plot. Here we see standard isotherm plots of a microporous and a mesoporous material in the upper section. The bottom graphs show the t-plots of the same materials. The reference material is displayed in blue. It is obvious that for the reference, a plot of absorbed quantity versus thickness results in a linear plot running through the origin. Now, as the multilayer region is less sensitive to the isosome shape and less dependent on the absorbent structure than the monolayer region, we can assume that the external surface part of our material behaves like the reference material and therefore the shift of the t-plot to comparably higher absorbed volumes is caused by the micropores. Hence, the slope of the linear range of the t-plot corresponds to the external surface area and the intercept of the y-axis corresponds to the micropore volume. When it comes to the determination of pore size, we find a lot of different models. What we refer to as classical models are methods based on the classical theories, where the assumption is made that the fluid inside the pores behaves in the classical way like in bulk phase. Most of those models are based on empirical studies and refer to specific classes of materials. Well known and widely used is the model of Barrett, Joyner and Helena, also referred to as BJH model. It is based on the Calvin equation and the thickness curves we just heard about. For microporous materials, you typically find other models being used. SBJH underestimates the size of narrow pores due to limitations of the Kelvin equation in confined space. Horvath and Kawasoe developed a method to calculate pore size of microporous carbons. Their model is based on the potential energy of a single molecule between two parallel planes. Later, Saito and Foley used the assumptions of the HK model, but applied the potential function to cylindrical pores of infinite length. And finally, Cheng and Yang extended the theory to spherical pores. In those classical models, a single pressure is defining one pore size. Also, a huge drawback is that the real behavior of the adsorbate in correlation with the pore size is not considered. What you see here is the density profile of argon as a function of pore size. The red line marks the bulk density of liquid argon at 87 Kelvin. You can clearly see that the smaller the pore sizes, the more the density of the adsorbate deviates from the bulk behavior. That is the reason why more modern models for determining pore size distributions are based on statistical thermodynamics and account for the influence of confined space. Using the density functional theory, a molecular-based statistical thermodynamic theory, to create models for pore size calculations has become a well-established approach. The theory is used to model the properties of the sorptive fluid confined within the pores. This is done by calculating density profiles, reflecting the behavior of the adsorbate at different pressures. The values are then used to generate a set of theoretical isotherms. We call that DFT kernel or DFT model. The graph shows such a kernel. Notice that each theoretical isotherm represents one pore size, in this case given in angst terms. In practice, this means the fluid density is calculated for one adsorptive at one temperature 
for one specific material having a defined pore geometry, one pore size and at one pressure. You can probably imagine that creating those kernels takes a lot of time to calculate. Now I'd like to show you how to use DFT in the Micromerotic software. This isotherm is from an activated carbon, and you can already see from the shape of the isotherm that besides micropores, there's also some porosity in the mesoporous range. The model I used for the calculation is a 2D NLDFT model for slit pores, with nitrogen as adsorptive at 77 Kelvin. And this particular model especially accounts for the heterogeneity of the surface. At this point, one side note. We are constantly working on refining DFT models and making new models available. All those models can be downloaded at the Micromerotics customer portal. In the Microactive software, you now select DFT pore size, and this window will open. You select the right pore geometry for your material and choose a model. The software will only allow those models available for the adsorptive and the analysis temperature. The lower right graph shows the isotherm and can be used to exclude data points. The upper graph shows the pore size distribution. The lower left graph gives us the goodness of fit in red and the roughness of distribution in green. We see here a typical data reduction. Using the highest degree of goodness of fit leads to a noisy pore size distribution. It is therefore important to apply a regularization, which is smoothing. Here, ideally, a range is selected where both the goodness of fit as well as the roughness of distribution show minimum values. A good starting point, therefore, is the intersection of the two lines. We see the regularization leads to more realistic and less noisy pore size distributions. Depending on the course of the goodness of fit curve, we might even increase the regularization a little bit further, as shown here. And what I would then always recommend is to have a look at the goodness of fit graphs. You find those in the report as shown here in half logarithmic and normal scale. The red crosses are your experiment data points and the black curve is the theoretical isotherm calculated from the DFT model. You see that in this case, we have a really nice fit. I already mentioned biochars. Using renewable sources to synthesize activated carbons is very attractive. A lot of those biochars possess very small micropores. Nitrogen and argon adsorption are both carried out at cryogenic temperatures. And filling of pores with dimensions of 0.5 to 1 nanometers occurs at very low relative pressures. At those temperatures and pressures, rates of diffusion and equilibration are very slow. For porous carbons, the adsorption of carbon dioxide at 273 Kelvin has therefore become an alternative for pore size calculations. Under these conditions, CO2 has a higher diffusion rate than nitrogen and argon, which allows molecules to more easily access the ultra micropores. NLDFT models are available for determination of pore size distributions. The drawback of carbon dioxide in comparison with nitrogen and especially argon is its large quadrupole moment. This fact makes it difficult to calculate surface areas. As CO2 has a saturation pressure of around 26,000 torr at 273 Kelvin, we are limited to a small relative pressure range unless high pressure adsorption instruments are used. This comes also with a limit of pore size that can be achieved. However, a combination of CO2 and nitrogen adsorption allows for the investigation of the complete pore size range. This combination is not just merging data from two DFT calculations into the same graph. It can rather be seen as an extended modeling process. Data from two measurements are loaded and two models are applied. The pore size ranges that are detected by one experiment so ultra micropores by CO2 and mesopores by nitrogen, are determined by the corresponding model. Whereas in the range which is covered by both experiments, both DFT models are used together. In this way, a single pore size distribution is calculated rather than cutting out a piece from the CO2 analysis and matching it with a piece from the uh, nitrogen results. Data reduction in the microactive software is easy and is done in the same way as I just showed you for a single isotherm of activated carbon. 
This method is referred to as NRDFT advanced pore size distribution. We have talked a lot about micropores now, but I think everyone working in processing and using porous materials for scaled up application probably knows that beside the activity that small pores bring, for instance, to catalytic reactions, mass and heat transport are also an important aspect. This is why hierarchical porosity is a very important field. Where there are hierarchical pore systems, there are also pore connections. Therefore, I now want to show you one example of hierarchical zeolites and how gas adsorption was used to learn more about their pore connectivity. Different phenomena lead to different shapes of hysteresis loops. We see on the left side how isotherms look like when using models based upon the Calvin equation, independence of pore size. The hysteresis loop is an H1 type, and a common explanation for the hysteresis is related to different phase transition behavior in adsorption and desorption. Having more complex interconnected pore networks typically leads to the phenomenon that pore windows control the desorption, leading to large hysteresis loops like we see on the right side. One way to approach hierarchical porosity in zeolites is treating the zeolites with steam or acids and bases to leach out larger pores. The nature of the acids have a huge influence on how many and what kind of mesopores are built. The example I brought is from a collaboration that Micro Murdochs did with a group of Professor Javier Perez Ramirez at the ETH Zürich. They did a really nice systematic study on site type zeolites. TEM images capture the heterogeneity of the mesoporous architecture and illustrate nicely the complex development of mesopores within individual phosphocyte crystals based upon the nature of the postsynthetic modifications. Let's have a look at the isotherms of some selected samples from that study. CBV300, illustrated in orange, was the starting material. And therefore, showing purely micropores, we get the expected type 1 isotherm. For the treated materials, we now see a transformation to type 4 isotherms, characteristic of a hierarchical pore system coupling micro and mesoporosity. The comparison also demonstrates the transition in the hysteresis loop from type H2 to H4 or H5, from CBV720 to CBV720B1 and CBV720B3 with increasing severity of base treatment. In comparison, up to 11 times increase in the mesopore surface area and 8 times increase in the mesopore volume resulted depending on the extent of demetallation with respect to the starting material. We know from molecular simulations that adsorption and desorption processes in micro and mesopores occurs in two consecutive steps due to the different energetics. However, to further investigate the relation between the mesopore structure and the hysteresis behavior, scanning isotherms were acquired by partial saturation of the pore structure, followed by a high-resolution desorption measurement, successively increasing the pore saturation. We can assume different pore types as illustrated in the graphics. Note that what looks like a grid is meant to be the micropores. Regarding mesopores, we can now think of pyramidal ones, where the pore entrance or window is larger than the inner pore. Constricted pores are those where the pore window is in the mesopores range, but smaller than the pore cavity. And as occluded pores, we define those mesopores that are connected to a micropore entrance. Depending on the pressure, different sets of pores are filled. Using the hysteresis scans, the incremental change in pore volume is now subsequently calculated in stepwise cycles of partial saturation and complete emptying across the entire region of the hysteretic mesopores. NLDFT models are then applied to extract the pore size distribution of saturated mesopores and corresponding volumes, enabling the construction of 2D counterplots that you see here. The mesopore diameter is plotted with respect to the window size. The white lines separate the regions of corresponding pyramidal, constricted and occluded mesopores. For comparison, the first counterplot is the one of the purely micropore zeolite as the starting material. After treatment under the mildest conditions, in a first step, mesopores with uniform geometry are formed. 
treating the sample with mild acids enhances the fraction and amount of pyrimidyl mesopores, which have varying sizes. And more severe acid treatment further increases the amount of occluded mesopores, coupled with the appearance of a higher number of cavity-like mesopores, which is consistent with the further framework delumination expected under these conditions. Subsequent desilication of the zeolites by treatment with base now leads to the largest mesoporosity gains, increasing the size of existing as well as generating new mesopores. Both the amount and fraction of pyramidal mesopores increase with the strength of the base treatment. Interestingly, the fraction of occluded mesopores reduces with the gain in constricted mesopores, indicating that the base treatment increases the degree of interconnection between the mesopores. We see from this study that the development of mesopores by distinct postsynthetic approaches strongly depends on the impact of any preceding treatments. And the information gained by differential hysteresis scanning helps to better understand key aspects in the design of the zeolites as well as their impact on the performance. Coming to this point, I thank all of you for your attention and your interest in this topic, and I'm now happy to answer some questions. Thank you, Katerina. I'm opening the chat for everyone's questions now, and we already have a few. Um, early in your talk, you were discussing uh, BET surface area. Um, is that generally applicable to all materials? Uh, that, that's a really good question. And um, I would say in general, yes. Um, BET is an, a general method. You can apply that to all kinds of uh, materials. Um, but there are limitations, and sometimes it can be the case that uh, depending on your material, depending on the isosome shape especially, BT cannot be applicable. What we see typically is that for type 2 and type 4A um, isotherms, so um, macroporous or unporous materials and um, mesoporous materials, the, the range where we have this linear range in the BET plot, that's always the range we're looking at for the right determination of the monolayer capacity. So this range is typically in, in the relative pressure range of 0.05 to 0.3. Um, that's what we find for many materials. But if we look at other isotherm shapes, um, for instance, type 3 or type 5, which are um, typical for materials where the um, interaction between the adsorbate and the adsorbent is very weak. So we don't have very high um, adsorption enthalpies. And uh, in that case, we can't assume that we really build a nice monolayer because um, the interactions between the adsorbate itself is just much larger than with the surface. And in such cases, uh, it's typically that we can't apply the BT um, plot. We will not get a, a nice linear region because this point where the monolayer is built is just not um, detectable. And um, then as mentioned um, in the talk, um, especially for microporous materials, we have the other case. So rather than having low adsorption enthalpies, we have really high adsorption enthalpies. And if that's the case, what we see typically for not just microporous materials, but in general, if those higher adsorption energies are present, we have to shift the range of relative pressures that we use for data reduction to lower relative pressures. And this is especially the case in microporous materials. And that is why um, um, Rockerol Llewellyn and Rockerol um, brought up this procedure that just helps to uh, overcome the difficulties in finding the right uh, range, the right linear range, because sometimes that's not just that straightforward. Uh, staying with BET surface area, uh, we have a question on what's the physical meaning of the C parameter in the BET equation? Yeah, the C um, constant um, contains the adsorption enthalpy of the monolayer and also the condensation enthalpy. 
And that means um, that the C constant is exponentially related to the energy of monolayer adsorption. And um, what I just explained um, about different adsorption entropies um, leading to different linear ranges um, is also related to the C constants. Um, in general, we can say that the C value gives us a useful indication of the shape of the isotherm in the BET range. And typical values for um, those type 2 and type 4A isotherms um, are values of a, approximately 80 or higher than 80. And that means that the, the knee in the isotherm is sharp. So we have this point B that is also indicated in, in the isotherms I showed that you find in the UPAC recommendation. And if this point B is well defined, that means that we have a nice formation of monolayer. That's um, what we are always looking at for, for the BET calculation. Now, if the adsorption enthalpies go to lower values, we would therefore also get lower C constants. And that um, comes with um, an overlap of monolayer and multilayer adsorption. So um, we can come to the point that this knee or this point B is not um, well defined enough anymore. And then in the other direction, if we have those low uh, adsorption enthalpies, like for microporous materials, what we typically see here is um, that we have very large C values. So staying with uh, questions about the C value, we, we've got a number of uh, attendees who've asked a similar question, and that is, um, what's your suggestion with respect to surface area if you get a negative uh, C constant from the BET equation? Mm -hmm. um, that is what we see many times for microporous materials. And we typically see that um, if we did not select the right range for the data reduction. Um, so this is exactly what this um, procedure I introduced um, tries to help with, because if the, the C value is negative, that's something according to the, the enthalpies that, uh, that are contained in the calculation of the C value, um, this is physically not possible. Um, so a negative C value always gives you the hint that the range for data reduction was selected in the wrong manner. Um, so that is why also in those four criteria, I introduced the C value um, as one of those four criteria. It always has to be positive. So what we typically do, we shift the range for data reduction to lower relative pressures. And um, when this, this topic first came up, um, before we had this um, um, the, the, the software which come uh, with auto BETs um, solutions, what you typically did is that from the typical BET range, you um, put out uh, values from the the higher relative pressure range, and you added data points uh, in lower relative pressure range. And you did that as long uh, as the C constant was negative. That was the old fashioned way of doing this. Um, now what I like is that that our software, and I think also other softwares come with the auto BET possibilities that check for those four criteria and that help you a lot to find the right range and uh, select the right range, the right linear range so that you know that you're in a but reliable um, area for data reduction. Mm. Um, the next one is, can you comment on temperature conditions and how they might affect the adsorption isotherm? So basically, how does the preparation temperature affect the adsorption isotherm and then possibly surface area for a material? Mm -hmm. um, that's a really good point. Um, sample preparation is very crucial. Sometimes I would even say it's more important than um, the measurement itself, because if your material is not activated, so that means you still have something adsorbed inside the pores or on the surface, this of course will lead to, um, to lower surface areas, to lower pore volumes, because space is somehow occupied by, by other molecules. And you always want to try to get your material as activated as possible. Um, unfortunately, that means that 
typically you have to put some work and some time in finding the right conditions because this relates a lot to your material um how thermally stable is it what what is inside the pores do you have um solvents left or is it uh, just moisture um there are many different things that, that can be inside the pores. And so you have to find the right conditions to um, get everything desorbed that is inside the pores before you do the experiment. And um, for some materials, the high temperatures can also lead to phase transformations. So that is something which you also want to avoid on the other side. So um, to find the right conditions which is the right temperature, the right time, and whether you want to apply vacuum or just um, treat your sample in inert gas um, is something you, um, where I would recommend to, to put some effort and some time in finding the right conditions. And um, what you typically would see, um, or a good starting point is checking the, the weight. If your weight is stable, um, that gives a good hint that you totally activated and totally tried your material and then another way of checking is um, choose different conditions check for the BET value and what you will see is that if the material was not activated um, at the beginning the higher you choose the temperatures or the longer you choose the activation um, time the BET area typically gets to higher values and if there's something like phase changes occurring uh, you will see um, really great changes in BET area um, that can go in different directions depending on what happens inside the material. And um, what also could help is um, using other technologies like um, powder XRD or um, thermal gravimetric analyses uh, to help finding the right conditions and to check whether your material is still in the right uh, phase and um, then I hope once you found the the right conditions um, it's easier for for all the following analyses. Um, switching a little bit to pore size distributions um, how do you select which is the most suitable NLDFT model because there are many models available for characterizing the material? Yeah, that, that is right. <laughs> um, the, it, as looking at those lists and all the different models that are available uh, already shows us that uh, it's quite important to find the right model. And again, you need to know a little bit about your material. And um, typically, the names of those models are quite obvious, so they refer to activated carbons or carbons in general, they refer to um, zeolites um, or oxide uh, surface materials. And um, if you want to have an overview, um, what I like is checking on, on our homepage. So the Micromordix homepage has a list of all the NLDFT models that we have available with our software. Um, you also find this information in the manual or the uh, yeah, the handbooks of the instrument, or if you use the online help function inside the microactive software, if you um, search for the NLDFT models, um, it relates to the um, original literature, so you can uh, have a good feeling of um, what materials were used to uh, create those NLDFT models, and that will help you and um, guide you a little bit in finding the right model for your material. Uh, for characterizing uh, nanopores below two nanometers, um, what's your recommendation for gas and parameters um, for pore size distributions below two nanometers? Mm, it, it depends on on the smallest um, micropores you expect. Um, using nitrogen at 77 kelvin and argon at 87 kelvin um, can can resolve pores being smaller than two nanometers um, as i i showed with the example um, i had in my talk um, we some at some point come to the to the point where um, the kinetics 
uh, are, are our key issues. So even though argon and nitrogen would still fit inside the pores, um, it might be the case that at those cryogenic temperatures, the diffusion is just um, too slow. Um, so that can lead to, to problems with the um, equilibrium times then. Um, but it really depends on um, what smallest pores you are expecting. Um, I would say that um, down to 0.5 nanometers, nitrogen and argon can still be used. If you expect lower pores, um, then CO2 is really a, a good gas or a good adsorptive, um, which has limitations if it comes to um, um, polar surfaces. So that really works well with um, carbons, but in zeolites, uh, it's not the best gas to use because of the large quadruple moment. What we are working um, on at the moment is using hydrogen for those small pores. That's something where you can already find some publications by um, my colleague Jacek Jagiello. And I expect that this is something um, that we will implement in the software as well. And I think that's a good, um, good alternative for those small pores, something that um, I hope will be will, will be available soon. I'm not sure about the uh, time schedule for this. Um, can you discuss a bit more about the details for collecting a CO2 isotherm? Um, and is there anything special that you need to do with respect to the instrument uh, and, and also the relative pressure range um, for that type of characterization? Yes. Um, <clears throat> So typically we use um, 273 Kelvin as um, analysis bath temperature. Um, <clears throat> and the saturation pressure of CO2 at that temperature is around 26,000. And that gives you the limitation in regard of the relative pressures um, that are um, possible for the measurements. Um, now I don't have the values in, in mind, but I can so that leads to a maximum relative pressure of around 0 0.03. Um, so that shows us that we are restricted to the really low relative pressures and therefore only the very small pores will be filled. It will not give us an idea of the whole a poor volume because um, we are restricted in that regard. And um, of course, as the saturation pressure is really, really high, what you don't want to do is try to measure that like you would do it for argon or nitrogen measurements at cryogenic temperatures. So in the settings for P0, you um, just um, uh, type in the temperature and you say use temperature to calculate the P0 and um, yeah, that's basically um, it. That's what you have to take care of. And um, you can, uh, one recommendation, typically all our software comes with example files. Um, you find those in the, the data, data examples folder. And there should be also CO2 example files. Um, that's always something where you can get started with looking at um, some example measurements and the parameters that were set uh, in those examples. So uh, in your presentation, you had several nice examples of uh, how to determine the micropore volume. Do you have a specific recommendation um, for determining the micropore volume using T-plot or NLDFT? Mm. I always like a combination. So um, I never just use one method, but I would compare the methods and depending on the material, um, all those methods have um, weak and stronger points. Um, I mean, in general, um, as I explained, the, the models, the more modern models based on molecular statistical thermodynamics, like the, the DFT methods, um, they are more realistic and they are considered to be the most reliable and powerful approaches um, for pore size distribution, um, but they also account for the pore volume. Um, it's difficult to say, um, but um, 
when it comes to micropores, you find the T plot a lot, um, basically probably due to the different thickness curves available and um, it's a quite common um, method. We also have the alpha S plot, which is similar, but rather than um, comparing to, um, to the thickness of a reference material, a uh, reference isotherm is used and normalized to uh, the amount adsorbed at a pre-selected relative pressure. And um, in, in direct comparison, one advantage of the alpha S plot might be that it is um, not needed to have the evaluation of the monolayer capacity, which can be difficult for microporous materials, as we heard several times. Um, but yeah, I would say it depends a lot of, um, of the materials, of the history that comes with those materials. And um, I would give several values um, for comparison reasons and, and just state that the different methods lead to those different uh, values. Typically, they are not too far away from each other. You, you typically see a, a good agreement with all those methods. So th this next question is a comparison uh, between two uh, methods. Um, how does the BET surface area from adsorption, um, where we look at micropores and mesopores, how does that compare with mercury pore symmetry, where we look at mesopores and macropores? How do those two correspond? Mm, um, that, that's a very interesting question. Uh, again, <laughs> I hate it that I always have to say it depends a lot on the material, but it's just the truth. Um, if your material does not have micropores, so if all the pores are accessible by mercury pore symmetry, um, which can resolve down to pore sizes of around 3.6 nanometers. So if you only have pores being larger than that, I would expect both methods to give um, comparable surface areas. I mean, the, calc the way of calculation is different. Um, as we learned today, BET uses the monolayer capacity and the cross-sectional area to calculate for the surface of the material. In mercury perithymetry, um, the Washburn equation is used, and um, what we measure there is the volume of pores being filled with mercury, and then it's a geometrical approach to calculate for the surface area, just assuming that all pores are in cylinder shape. So those different calculations lead, of course, to, to different um, or can lead to different values depend, depending on the real port geometries you have. Um, sometimes the agreement is really, really good. What we typically see if micropores are present or if you have pores lower than those 3.6 nanometers, then you will typically or, or definitely get higher values using BET because um, um, mercury then cannot apply for those pores and the surface caused by those small pores. Uh, so we're almost out of time this morning, so th this will be the final question uh, for for today. Um, how, do, how does the large quadrupole moment um, of the CO2, how does that affect the isotherm or surface area uh, when you're using CO2? The the quadrupole moment um, can can lead to very strong interactions, and as those um, gases like like nitrogen as well um, and CO2, they they are not spherical molecules, um, so it's difficult to say which surface is really occupied by this gas. And um, the the stronger the the interactions or the more polar the surfaces are, um, the more the, the gas um, molecules can um, absorb in a way that it's difficult to predict the, the real cross-sectional area. And um, that is uh, the crucial part why, um, why the values we get from those calculations are sometimes not really reliable or give a wrong idea of what's uh, really present inside the material. 
Katerina, thank you very much for your presentation and the wonderful answers to all of the questions. Um, is there anything else you'd like to add to this webinar? Um, I just want to say thank you again, um, also for all those interesting questions. Um, I always enjoy seeing what uh, people are thinking about, what questions they have in mind. And so I'm really happy that we had this discussion. And um, at this point, take care, have a good day, and hope to hear you soon again. Great. Thank you, everyone, for participating in today's webinar. We hope you found it useful and beneficial. Do not forget to check back for upcoming webinars on micromeridics.com slash webinars and hope to welcome you again very soon. Thank you and have a good day.